Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lexi Neely, and I'm the program coordinator at Little Free Library. And this is Little Free Library Unbound. So thank you for joining us. Welcome back if you've been here before. And welcome if this is your first episode of Unbound you're tuning into. My colleague Shelby, the director of programs at Little Free Library, is here supporting us as we do Unbound today. If you have questions or tech issues, she will be monitoring the chat so you can send a message to her. She already shared um, some tips for having the best viewing experience so you can see our slides and our speakers today. Um, so Shelby will be there to support you if you have questions. And if you have questions for our guests, you can feel free to leave them in the chat. If we have extra time, we'll try to get to those um, in addition to the questions we already have prepared to discuss. I am pleased to hand things over to Little Free Library's National Board Chair, Anita Marina, and she's going to take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 15 of Little Free Library Unbound. Um, we're, I'm so excited because today we're celebrating independent bookstores, my favorite place in addition to libraries. It's my you know, comfort zone. Um, we're celebrating independent bookstores and authors and independent publishers and independent bookstore day is april 30th so we have a lot to celebrate we've been so very proud to partner with independent bookstores and authors and publishers around the country through our reading color program so so blessed to do that now you know that breaking into the publishing industry can be really hard for many, many writers, aspiring writers, even current writers continue to, you know, find challenges. So independent publishers always make that possible for people to, from all walks of life to share um, their stories from their lives, to share their experiences and, uh, and characters. These small but mighty publishers make it really, really wonderful to amplify the voices of independent authors and reach communities that very often are left behind. Um, and, and I think that this is a, such a great service to all of us. Um, we are so, so pleased um, that it often makes people's dream of becoming an author and reaching communities a, a reality and telling stories. And in the same way, as you know, independent bookstores are some of the revolutionary places on earth. They are our standard bearers for what is um, exciting and courageous. Uh, you know that they're amplifying banned books right now. They are out there just really uh, amplifying voices and making the call. They foster community gathering and collaboration. They have events. They highlight many independent writers. And then they uphold those special con connections between people and authors. The, these are the things that make reading and sharing books so special. Um, bookstores like You and Me Books, Birch Bart Books, uh, Duende District in Washington, D.C., and so many places. Uh, my favorite now is having moved to Bellingham slash Fairhaven is uh, Village Books in uh, Fairhaven. So it, these are places that um, bring us great joy. Um, today, we are very, very pleased to be joined by two uh, activists, authors, advocates for reading. The first will be Chanda Austin, the author of Kiana's Braids, and Julie Tao, uh, author and publisher at Mong Baby, two very, very wonderful authors and, uh, you know, stars, reading stars. So let's start with Shonda. Um, Shelly, there you go. Shonda, oh, well, again, Educators Are My Heroes. She's been a public educator for over 20 years. She's the author of Kiana's Braids. She's also a board member of Read for Unity, a wonderful nonprofit whose aim it is to bring diverse books, uh, diverse narratives by collecting and distributing diverse literature throughout the community. And I've seen this work in action. It's really, really wonderful. And we had the great, great pleasure to partner with Read for, U Read for Unity on our Reading Color work in Atlanta. So a wonderful welcome to you. Thank you for joining us, Shonda. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. I do not take any opportunity for granted. So thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me uh, a seat at the table this evening. It is a big table. We are so honored to have you be part of it. 
Uh, we'd like you to start by talking about your book, Kiana's Grades, and what it means for you to have written it. So Kiana's Grades was almost a twofold. Uh, I tell this story often. Um, my daughter, who's given me permission to tell her story, um, actually really, really struggled with um, her own hair. And so um, Black girls struggling with hair, my stylist suggested that she get braids. And so she said, I believe in this process so much that I will pay for, you know, the first sitting. And so she got the braids and it literally turned her self-esteem around. Mm -hmm. And so as I said in the shop, week after week, I just thought about the subculture of the Black Beauty Salon and what a powerful place it is for Black women or just women of color. It's a very different space I think from other ethnicities, um, so many things have happened in that in that space, and so the story just came to me. Every I would just write and write and write, and finally it became a published piece. Um, so it literally just came to me being in that authentic place, um, learn, just being around these women who had all kinds of stories. To to tell and and seeing how it 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 changed the trajectory of how my daughter looked at herself. It's such a gift because seeing yourself in the pages of a book and seeing yourself celebrated, I think, for mothers and daughters and for aunties and friends, for the customers and for the community, it, it really is truly wonderful. That, so thank you for for writing that and reaching out and sharing that. Um, so you published. Kiana's Braids in 2020. So do you have another book coming down the pike for all of us? I actually do. I'm in a process and I've had some challenges if you ever self-published. Um, I am using um, KDP as my publishing um, platform. You know, you'll have some challenges before you get it like right. So my next book is actually an HBCU coloring book, and it is celebrating historical black colleges and universities, and it is an ABC book. And so what I wanted to do is highlight some of the smaller HBCUs and some HBCUs and some of the, the larger ones. And so I am hoping to have that book out before the summer. I've just had... <laughs> <laughs> some challenges getting it uploaded and, and just, you know, some of the things that come with, with trying to self-publish. I think it's great that you're highlighting HC, HBCUs because, you know, I lived near one in the Eastern Shore of mm -hmm. Maryland. And, okay. you know, people forget that there are large, well, they know the, the, you know, the standards bearers that people are very familiar with Morehouse and, and Spelman yeah. and so on. But there are small ones that are just doing tremendous work. So uh, this will be very exciting. And I, I keep seeing my friends post that their daughter or son, their child, you know, has gotten into another uh, HBCU. So. It's, this yeah. is really exciting. So yeah. um, future leaders, certainly. Um, you, as as you know, with struggling with, with getting your own book to be published, everybody else is often in that same position. So what advice would you give to someone with a story to share who's not sure about getting it in front of readers, who's not sure about, you know, is it is it a story that will resonate? So how would you counsel that particular aspiring writer? Um, so I tell people when they ask me, just do it. You have a story to share and somebody wants to hear it. It's not an overthought process. It's literally a just do it. Just do it and trust your process and believe in your work. Um, I honestly did not think Kiana's braids would have gone as far as it did because it was a personal project. But when I started seeing it on bookshelves, when I started having principals call and say, hey, we would like to have your book on our shelf, um, it is done well. And I honestly did not see this happening. And I realized, um, I don't know if the story is unique, but it's definitely relevant. But, and it's, when you write it for yourself, it's very yeah. often... Um, resonates with someone who relates. So that's very, yes. very true. Yeah. Um, so tell, tell me about um, sharing Kiana's braids with someone, uh, whether it's a parent, whether it's a, 
a, a young child. Do you have a memorable story from some of your travels with Kiana's Braids? Um, so one of probably the best stories that I've ever heard is a principal who shared the book with her with her students and just how children were. I mean, I literally got the, the, the she shared the written feedback with me from students and to see those babies be so excited about hearing a story that they were familiar with, seeing images that they can relate with. It literally, my job is done at that point, and mm -hmm. and so that's probably uh, the best story that I can tell. Um, having children of color, in particular, um, seeing their the, seeing themselves in the story and being able to have a relatable piece of literature in front of them that they can relate to. So on the and, flip side, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shonda. Um, I was going to say, even for, for um, young people that are not um, people right. of color, having, yeah. you know, learning about the story of how braids aren't just the protective style. There's literally okay. history behind the process, and uh, there's, there's stories about how braids were used, you know, during slavery for, for um for women and men to be able to leave their plantations through the pair, the patterns. And wow. I mean, just, and just snippets of, of the, not that I got into a history lesson, but really front loading the book with some history so that, that everybody would know that it's not just a protective style. Yeah, no, that's very, very true. Um, so one of my um, wonderful author friends who's, who's, you know, been doing great books. One of his experience, he lamented the fact that he was out of school and it, and, and during his signing, a, a teacher actually came up to him, or was a teacher school ever in, and she said, well, you know, we don't have that many uh, black students at our school. And so I, you know, I, I hesitate to have this in my school library or classroom or so on. And it, it was so disheartening for him because really, um, your stories are not just for your community because she was trying to make the point that your story, my story, say the I'm an Asian American, you know, the story is only for the community in which the, the member is from. What would be your response? But parents, this, this happens with authors all the time to them, parents, mm -hmm. um, librarians, or not so much librarians because they do more, but, but very often teachers sometimes will come up and make that point how would you respond and how can you help also other authors respond that it's still happening unfortunately um yeah. let's hear your response so my story doesn't have to be your story but i can honor yours yeah and, and so that is how we change right change is uncomfortable learning about different people and different things and eating at new restaurants and traveling places that you've never traveled. It doesn't have to be my story, but I can honor your story. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we, we have not done a good job in, in that space because it's uncomfortable. And most oftentimes people, they don't like to be uncomfortable. So and it, I think it also puts a level of responsibility on people once they understand the story. And so now you understand why uh, we have hair discrimination acts, right? Mm -hmm. Which I always correct people when they say things like dreadlocks because there's nothing dreadful about something that God has given you on your head, right? They're called locks. <laughs> and so there, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a space there to really teach people. I'm pretty sure there's something I can learn about you too that I didn't know. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so when we talk about creating global learners, when we talk about creating tolerance for people, um, this is how you do it. You do it through authentic literature. You do it through saying, you know what, I am going to try to go and eat at a restaurant that I've never eaten at. You know, I don't have to yeah. like it, but I can at least say I tried it, right? Yeah, exactly. And what is it? A choir is composed of people with different types of voices, right? So Absolutely. the chorus is stronger because there are different, uh, you know, con contributors to that song. And I think that that's just always a lovely way to do it. So uh, I'm, we're so, so grateful 
for you to be able to share your story, your book. We're very excited about what you're going to write next. This HCB, HBCU um, alphabet book is going to be a lot of fun. So I could see this ending up on a lot of people's, uh, you know, in baby showers and other places. But And also, congratulations, Read for Unity is a fabulous organization. We're so, so proud to have worked with them. So more oh, power to you. Amazing. It has been amazing. And just to give you a story about that, Yenny and I were talking uh, one day, and she was taking some books north of the city, north of Atlanta, a fluent area, and she had a story about a, a black, a, a, a black, a young man who had become a doctor. And so she was, you know, putting the books up, and uh, one of the one of the students said, "Oh, I thought, I thought only black, I thought black boys could only play basketball. What a great." What what a great segue to have a conversation about representation, right? Right. And how we need to be very intentional about what those spaces look like. You know, Asians yeah. can be doctors, black people can be doctors. Um, you know, doctors can anybody who decides to go to medical school can be a doctor. And okay. so we had a really rich conversation around how in this affluent area north of the city, you would have thought that this child would have been exposed to something different. And it was a great opportunity to say, well, no, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, more than sports. Yeah, exactly. No, it's very, they're, the richness of what we do when we share books um, with different stories is, um, you know, and that, that impacts somebody further down the line in, in sharing it again. I think that is the richness of being able to have that conversation with that parent, that child, or that um, adult in somebody's life. Now, we know that you have to um, go. Uh, we are so appreciative. Uh, anything else you would like to share with uh, Little Free Library Unbound before you head off? Um, we are so honored to have had you take part. I am honored to be here. Thank you for the work that you guys are doing, because I think I believe, I know for sure, the work that you're doing is going to be game-changing, and it's going to expose children of all ethnicities, backgrounds, and beliefs to something very different. And in order for us to have a one band, band one sound, this is the work that has to go forth. Uh, one of my favorite favorite lines from <laughs> one of my favorite movies, that One Band, One Sound, is Absolutely true. And and really a shout out to the independent bookstores who and independent publishers and see self, people who self-publish like you who are determined to get stories out there. So thank you. And we wish you well. We'll stay in touch with you as well. All right. Okay. Thank you, Shonda. Okay. okay. Uh, so we are so very pleased now to welcome our next next guest. And uh Welcome to Little Free Library Bound, Julie Thao. And Julie, please correct me if I mispronounce your name. She is the owner of Mong Baby, author of uh, Menuan Plus, Little Owl, which I'm so pleased to see these kinds of books out there because I have Hmong friends and they've been saying, like, where, where are the books with us that reach our kids and reach our families and our community? So we are, again, Super honored to have you on board. You're based in St. Paul, Minnesota, publishing bubble board books and learning materials in both Hmong and English. So that's really, really exciting. So welcome to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today. I'm such an honor to have been invited <laughs> to be a part of this. <laughs> well, tell us all about Hmong Baby and how that all began. Yeah, well... Mom Baby, we are a uh, local company to the Twin Cities area, and our vision is to provide parents with uh, learning materials that will empower them to teach their children Hmong language. So we have flashcards and books and learning videos on our YouTube that will help children to teach their, um, will help parents teach their children Hmong language. And it's, how it yeah, started, so it's, oh, oh, I, I was just going to talk about how it started. It's actually a pretty yeah. fascinating story. 
Um, I took over Mong Baby just last year in 2021. But before that, it was started by my sister-in-law. Her name is Mai Ku Tao. And in 2017, her daughter had just turned one. So just learning how to talk. And she wanted to teach her daughter Hmong language. So she um, started to look for learning materials and really just found that there wasn't much. There wasn't many materials, books out there, um, or that if there were at that time, it wasn't accessible to parents mm. and families to share with their, their children. So she took it upon herself to create these flashcards to teach her daughter um, how to... The, the names of animals and Hmong. And she just so happened to share with some friends and family. And while well, the response that she got from everyone just blew her out of the water. And it, it was just some simple flashcards. I think I have a set here that I can show you, Anita. But it was just these flashcards. Ah, so great. there's just, you know, there's an image of um, the animal and then the Hmong word below it. And she shared it with some friends and family, and the response she got just was what propelled her and really um, was the start of Hmong Baby. And so she put together the company, um, started as a platform to sell the flashcards, and then from there she wrote a book, and it that's how it started. <laughs> Oh, great. So actually, um, there may be people who are tuning in and maybe who, who access the video later who may mm -hmm. not be as familiar with the Hmong community. So let's yeah. um, do a little bit of an overview for, for a minute from you just about your community and, and um, you know, what's, where is, are you from? People may not really be associated with the, the background and your community itself and, and actually some of the places where you have settled. Yeah, so the Hmong people, we are an ethnic people um, with our own culture, our own language um, out of China. And uh, over the years, you know, we have, we have great history. And over the years, we've um, migrated down to the Southeast Asian country, um, such as Laos and Vietnam and Thailand. Um, and how we arrived in the U.S. is a history lesson on its own. But in the 60s, um, the Hmong people in the regions of Laos was actually recruited um, uh, and so, and, and to, to, the, um, to help with the U.S. during the Vietnam conflict. And from there, mm -hmm. you know, the Hmong people came over to the U.S. at the end of the conflict, and that's how my parents had come over in the 70s. Um, and after having come to the U.S., the Hmong people, there is a big community in uh, Minnesota, in California, in North Carolina, and in Wisconsin. So, um, yeah, unless you are from those major though those areas you may not have heard about the Hmong people but we are an ethnic people with our own culture and our own language yeah thank you so much it's really really mm -hmm. helpful um i so appreciate that um so you yourself now having taken over uh Hmong baby but you yourself also have a a new book coming out so we'd love you to tell us all about it and um and share it with us Oh, yeah. So I I have a book now. I have it here, actually. It's called That's Nino good. Blanc, and it is translated to Little Owl. So it's about a child going to bed. It's about bedtime. And the child sees something cute outside of her window, and it happens to be a little owl. And she just wonders about, you know, why isn't the owl asleep yet? Why is it still awake? What is it still doing? So in the book, you know, it's the child going and it wondering about the owl and it takes you through what the owl does at night, looking for food and observing and listening to the other animals that are still up at night. And this is actually a song. So I wrote it as a song and then I um, wrote it into a book. So they're actually the lyrics to a song that I had wrote for children. Excellent. How yeah. fun. That's wonderful. Um, 
So as I asked Shonda, um, there are a lot of aspiring writers out there, people who also want to share their stories and their character, their imagination. And what advice would you give to someone who has a story to share but not quite sure how to go about it, um, how to get it in front of readers and community members or get it out there in a broader space? What would you advise them? I would say um, to just do it. And I, I know that Shonda had said that too, but that really is what you have to do is to just do it. Um, I've had an idea for my children's book for a long time too. And it was just an idea. It was just a daydream for a very long time. But until I just, one day I said, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens, see where it goes. So the advice that I would give to people is to just do it because that is that is what I did. And the response that I got, it, it really blew me out of the water too. I mean, Anita, when I, when I came out with this book with Nino Blanc, I didn't think that, I, I was very nervous actually, that people would like it, would want to buy it for their children. But I thought, you know, there's a need there for books like this in the mom community. I'm going to put it out there and see where it goes. And so I had put out a pre-order just to gauge the interest mm -hmm. of everybody because I was still nervous. I was still like, hmm, I'm not sure if people would want it. So I better put out a pre-order first to see if anybody is even interested in the book. And so for one week, I put out a pre-order campaign and I, we were able to have pre-ordered almost 400 copies of the book. Yeah. That's exciting. So, yeah. So that just led me to see that there is a need out there for, for books like this and that people are interested in this. And so what I would say to anybody with an idea is to just put it out there. Um, these days, social media connects people very well. And I think that's one of the the vehicles that really propelled our pre-order launch too was social media, getting the word out there and really getting people to see that there's this book out and I want that too. So you just have to do it. If you have an idea, just go for it. Don't be afraid of whether or not people would want it, would buy it. You never know. There is someone out there who will resonate with your book and your story too. That's a really encouraging news. And, um, so very often, as I said to Shonda, there are people who look at diverse books and they say, well, you know, that's not my community. Hmong is very specific. But, but what would you say to, again, an adult who says, you know, I don't have that many Hmong in my community, but um, does this make sense for me to include this in the school library or in other places? What would your response be to, to an adult who says that? Yeah. I would say that as adults, it's our job um, to provide these kind of books for our children because our children, they, the younger children, they don't get to choose what books come into their home or what books go up onto their bookshelf or into their, their book collection. So it's up to us as parents and teachers to provide our children with these books because books, books, they are a window for children to look into other cultures and to see what it's like in a day um, in another culture. And so um, as adults, we really have to think like a child and see the world through the eyes of our child. And I say that because children are so, their, their minds, their hearts are so pure and innocent and they're so open to any kinds of books. And so we, we shouldn't discriminate that and we should give them the opportunity to really have as many books, uh, of diverse books as possible to expand their view of the whole world, um, the change of community around them. Um, even as a parent myself, I um, provide a lot of diverse books for my children. And my daughter, um, recently, I shared a book with her called Sue. Yeah. 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 You may have seen it, but 
it's about a little girl who just isn't happy with her skin color. About it's too dark, and she wishes that she could be her skin could be lighter. And I read mm-hmm. it to my daughter, and at the end of our reading, she said to me, "Mom, I feel the way Sue feels. I wish, I wish sometimes that my hair could be blonde." And so mm. it opened up a whole conversation yeah. to just yeah. who she is and to be happy with herself. So books are so magical that way. But as parents, we really have to see um, things through the eyes of our children and how they see the world and provide them with these kinds of books. And I think, like you said, there it, it begins a conversation that mm-hmm. leads to something even richer um, uh, Shelby just noted that we have lots of book recommendations. Um, Sulway and other books and books like yours are on our reading, uh, reading color recommended book list and there continue to be more and richer books. Uh, and as an author friend of mine said, she actually said to a parent who was putting her book away and it back into on the shelf, she said, you know, there are lots of books with dragons and books with, uh, you know, leprechauns or fanta- hobbits. Um, this, so that's another character that um, enriches a child's reading life. So why not people from other communities and cultures? And, and that's, that's an important point to make. So I, we so, so appreciate that. How about yeah. um, a memorable story from you in terms of your, the books that you publish, your book with a reader? Um, you, that was such a wonderful story, even with your daughter. How about any other readers that you've come across or even parents? Yeah, so a um, you know often we get videos and messages from parents who have uh, bought our books, and they will say things like you know my my daughter has never read a word of Hmong, but because of your book she has started reading some of the words. And last year we were at the uh, Hmong Arts and Crafts Fair in St. Paul, and one of the parents came up and she did say that you know my son has never read a word of Hmong and has never even spoken a word of Hmong. But when I bought the Hmong baby book, Oshi Oshi, he mm-hmm. started to read it because that this book has very simple text in it. So just a few words uh, with single uh, sentences on each page. But she said that her son started to want to read the book and started speaking Hmong. So that is, is a story that I like to share with a lot of parents. And even with parents, you know, who are not of Hmong descent and, and you know, feel like they don't know how to speak Hmong, on, on our YouTube channel, we have read-alongs of our books. And so even if you do not speak Hmong, you can go and watch our video where the book is read. And you can try to follow along and learn a new language. Ah, that's great, Julie. Well, as yeah. someone who was born in the U.S., who did not have the opportunity to learn my parents' Ivatan language and then, or even Tagalog by the time I came along, I'm one of five. So by the time I came along, I think they were of the generation that it was all about learning English, not having an accent and so on. So yeah, that was, I think, my parents' biggest regret, mine. But I love the fact that there are videos. Now there's a story in Ivatan, uh, at a, again, out of a small publisher, Sari Sari Books, and in uh, California that has these books that are really celebrating uh, our heritage, the Filipino heritage. So, so thank you yeah. so much. It's, it's really, this is why we celebrate independent publishers, independent bookstores and authors uh, like you and Chanda and everybody else out there. We are so, so pleased. And um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, um, do you have any, yeah, yeah, no, this is great. Um, so we, uh, we are so grateful to you and Chanda. We um, wanted to let you know uh, that's the end of our conversation with you. Um, but we also wanted to ha- let people know okay. that they can continue to look up your publisher. We can look for your books, um, find you at book, set, book signings and other places. Um, is there anything else you want to say to the, the followers out here? Um, just that I'm really glad for an organization like the, the Little Free Library and its book sharing uh, model across the entire world. I am a big believer in books for anybody, but especially for children as, you know, it, it acts as a window for children to look into other cultures 
and with books um, representation as well for people of color too. That way children can see themselves in the book because it just becomes that more powerful when they see someone um, who looks like them in a book. Because I know that growing up, I did see a lot of books like that. And I had always wanted to become an author, but because I didn't see anyone like me um, authoring children's book, I never thought that I would have the chance to, but you know, I would just say yeah. you know, an, an organization like Little Free Library is such a wonderful thing for everybody. And seeing you and Shonda publishing your books, books like Yana's Braids and and Mongavia and everything else, it, it's just such an important service. So thank you again. Um, now what I'd like to do, thank you, Julie. We're glad you're able to join us. Um, Little Free Library, as you know, we do this wonderful um, Todd Bowl, Todd H. Bowl Award, named after our um, founder, our late founder, Todd, who was just such a sweetheart, and um, he would have loved this, this conversation. Um, we're accepting nominations for the Todd H. Bowl Awards for Outstanding Achievement. Um, Little Free Library, uh, do we celebrate our individual stewards and what they do and how they really share, um, really expose the world's kindness to their communities through the act of book sharing. Um, every year we select a group of, of stewards who exemplify Todd's vision and um, celebrate his spirit through that way. You can check out past winners, but also you can submit a nomination for the award in the link at the chat. And photos of our past winners are here on here and then also on the website. So thank you and thank you uh, Shelby and Lexi for another great, great uh, Little Free Library and Down. Thank you, Anita. And thank you so much to Shonda and Julie for joining us today. Uh, Unbound is always the highlight of my month. Always great to hear um, from fellow book lovers. Um, I'm a big believer in independent bookstores and publishing. Um, it's very dear and dear to my heart and um, my experience in college and beyond. Um, so it's been so special for me to share that with all of you. Um, as stewards, independent authors can be your best friends. They are eager to share their stories um, and they want to do that. They want their stories to be accessible. So you can consider approaching local authors to host a reading at your little free library. Um, that'll give them a way to connect to the community, um, to share their book and get people excited about the story they have to share um, and bring people together at your library, which is always a lot of fun. I want to do a quick plug for bookshop.org, uh, where Little Free Library has a storefront. Um, bookshop is an online bookstore with a mission to financially support local independent bookstores. You can choose your favorite local bookstore or one that's across the country and know that your purchase will support them. Purchases from our bookshop storefront support our programs, including the Impact Library Program and Reading Color. And on our bookshop page, you can see some of our top reading color recommendations in each category, our action book club of readings um, by the different themes that we have. Little Free Library staff favorites, if you're ever interested in what our staff is reading. And the list of books our staff and board of directors are reading as part of our allied book club. Um, so if you haven't already, check out Bookshop and give some love to indie bookstores. Um, it is was created as an answer to Amazon. Um, so if you're passionate about um, supporting writers, independent bookstores, and independent publishing, um, Bookshop is a really great place to start. It's a one-stop shop, so it's got the convenience of shopping online. And like I mentioned, it can, you can support a local bookstore, um, an organization you love like Little Free Library, or a bookstore that you just heard of in a news article that could use some love um, that's not even in your neighborhood, um, and you can support them with your purchase of books. Thank you again to everyone for tuning in. I hope you feel inspired to visit your local indie bookstore and check out some of the local and independent books they have to offer. Um, I think every wonderful bookstore has a cool little local author section, um, and it's amazing to see what you can learn about your community. There could be history there that you've never heard of or someone who's telling a story that really resonates with you or opens your eyes to a whole different perspective. As always, 
attendees will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the replay, the show notes, and you can sign up for a chance to win one of three book bundles, including Kiana's Braids and Kuv Uatau from Mung Baby. And you can register for next month's episode of Unbound at the link in the chat. If you haven't already, we encourage you to follow Little Free Library on social media. We are everywhere that you are. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. And um, sign up for our e-newsletter to stay in the know about future chapters of Unbound and other exciting Little Free Library news. Thank you so much again for joining us. Take care.